Natasha Leonard is a columnist for The Intercept. She's also written for The Nation, The Guardian, Book Forum, and The New York Times, among other venues. She currently teaches critical journalism at the New School for Social Research in New York. Her books include Being Numerous, Essays on Non-Fascist Life from Verso, and a co-written anthology of interviews on the question of violence entitled Violence, Humans in Dark Times. In our interview, she addresses how she views the role of journalism in critical writing, stressing that communication is, quote, necessary but deeply insufficient as a means of creating radical structural change. I appreciated the ways that she interrogates the seductive concept of a marketplace of ideas and this seemingly unassailable notion of free speech. Instead, she's invested in ideas of accountability and a public sphere in which we're forced to reckon with how speech acts can call into being fascist realities. Rather than calling it censorship, Leonard sees a culture of accountability, consequence culture as Roxane Gay has put it, as a matter of intervening to insist on less oppressive spaces, and emphasizes that a just world would pivot the center, in Patricia Hill Collins's words, so that those who are directly affected by hateful material could lead the project of deplatforming fascism. While she acknowledges that Twitter, taking away the means of creating what she calls fascistic life worlds, is a progressive step, she also makes it clear that we should not be required to wait for Silicon Valley leviathans to regulate hate and, you know, slowly cave to leftist organizing and resistance. A publicly owned social media is possible and would be preferable to this. Broadly speaking, her book, Being Numerous, argues for the power of using that term, fascism, to name the authoritarian desires that drive white supremacy, suggesting that it's useful as a means of capturing the violent nature of the forces we oppose and for calling into being an anti-fascist response. Her work is wonderfully clear on the tensions between materialist politics and social constructivism, drawing from Donna Haraway's notion that the world is made, but not made up. It was really helpful to get to speak with her about how to leverage empathy and guilt over the continued destruction of black lives, about the ineffectiveness of just excavating more black death, and the need to elevate movements that refuse to just wait for the next death spectacle in order to create the conditions for change. She argues that the struggle of our times is to figure out how to create opposition both all at once and slowly and reflectively, as challenging as that inherently is. Rather than offering a simply hopeful framing Leonard asks us to actually engage with the impressively fast rebuilding of a robust left-wing politics after decades of what she calls ideological decimation. Um, so the first uh, question that I want to raise is this, this weird story uh, around this giant boat that's stuck in the Suez Canal. There's a couple articles that I've, I've read recently that uh, give this interesting context. There was one in the Financial Times by Brendan Greeley um, that talks about this, this ship uh, running aground as a kind of accident. And I know you've written a great deal about um, accident from the you know, perspective of somebody who has read Paul Virilio and really invested in this idea that there's no, no such thing precisely as an accident when you inhabit this kind of built environment. And this is really how Greeley is approaching it. Like he says, you know, this is a, an unplanned birth that happened in part because of a sudden gust of strong wind, but also because of the nature of the Suez Canal itself uh, as a kind of human structure. Um, mm. And even more interestingly, I thought um, Amanda Mull has this article in The Atlantic called, uh, it has a great title, The Big Stuck Boat is Glorious. Um, and she talks about how the ship is, you know, longer than the Empire State Building is tall um, and that, you know, now you have this enormous, uh, you know, backup of these massive shipping vessels sh transporting things from live animals to crude oil, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's this idea that um, the Suez Canal becomes visible to the globe because of an accident. Right. And so, yeah, I wanted to quote Greeley. He says, a gust of wind is by definition an act of God. We all understand. But the initial explanation offered by Evergreen steps gingerly around another possible reason that the boat ran aground. The Ever Given, which is the name of the ship, is a very large boat. And very large boats and confined channels don't move in predictable ways. Um, and, and so like it becomes visible to us. And this is the whole point of Mull's article is the visibility factor, right? This system of 
global manufacturing and trade becomes uh, visible to us in ways that produce friction. Mm-hmm. And my, my question is about basically, you know, because I, I, I watched your conversation with Mackenzie Wark and the two of you, you, you raised this interesting question um, of whether, you know, there are moments of apertures and openings that are created um, at, at these kind of key moments. Um, do you feel like there there is sort of like a key moment here where the events like the ever given running aground gives us a chance to, I guess, reflect on the absurdity of the system, if only through memes? Um, and do we need like maybe more, more pointed explanatory journalism to really give us a sense of the importance of events like this? Um, well, c- well, certainly. And I think, you know, the obviously there's uh, a kind of complete awe surrounding Big Stuck Boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think your point of of what it makes visible, I mean, the, the nature of this kind of taken for granted, but extraordinary nature of the global supply chain. And, you know, we, we see all these memes and make all these jokes about, you know, comrade Big Stuck Boat, um, <laughs> you know, the supply chain on strike. Um, and, you know, but yet I don't, you know, we think of these, you know, 20, 20,000 con- vast containers on Big Stuck Boat. We don't even know what's in them. So there is this kind of making visible the opacity of a supply chain that is extraordinarily complicated and relies on so much um, extraction and exploitation. Um, and yet at the same time, the fact that, you know, it, it can be ru- disrupted by something as simple as the boat is too big, Mm -hmm. the Suez Channel is too narrow, um, is kind of this extraordinary revelation of both the complexity and simplicity of uh, talking about how commodities move around the world. I think your um, reference to to the accident and Virilio is really, really apt and interesting um, and, you know, maybe should should be more memed, even though it's a little little hard to reduce into just a, a funny picture. Mm. But um, but I think it's a point. And, you know, so for listeners who might not uh, necessarily have heard what, what Virilio means, uh, the late Paul Virilio meant by accident um, is precisely as you say, it's not it's not how we might use the word in ordinary parlance of like, oh, a mistake that we didn't see coming. Um, Paul Virilio's idea as applied to technological advancement is that with each new advent um, and each new item of what we might call progress, um, new accidents are introduced to the world, into, into the kind of realm of possibility in the world. So, you know, the obvious example is before you have a car invented, you don't have a car crash as a possibility. So with the car, you invent the car crash. With the airplane, you invent the airplane crash. With, you know, uh, nuclear power, you inv- you um, you know, invent the possibility of nuclear disaster. And with um, the kind of vast and uh, voracious nature of global capital and its movement and the nature of the boat is too big, you invent the possibility of big stuck boat. Um, and so it's not that the accident is the inevitability, but it is baked into the very nature of what gets called progress and is often overlooked and you know the same uh when I've written about it I haven't just um I've kind of wanted to address address it not just to technological uh quote-unquote progress but um you know this idea of of liberalism and progress and the different ways um you know accidents of liberal democracy call it Donald Trump call it a right uh you know a fascist turn are also baked in to the content context they're not some aberration so I think yeah big stuck boat is almost this um kind of perfect like Mm -hmm. synecdoche accident of like big stuck boat stands for um accident of global capital and I think you know if asking about whether it constitutes some like aperture um you know like do do I think we'll suddenly have like a completely different orientation and a political shift based on big stuck boat um, no, I don't. Um, I think it'll probably become unstuck and get, you know, swallowed into that moment in the meme cycle that in a few months will be like, hey, remember Big Stuck Boat? But uh, that doesn't mean I don't think it is a 
uh, certainly an, the kind of event around, yeah, which we should, you know, pause and consider. And um, given that it has been so memeified and people are enjoying it so much, like what is... I think it's worth reflecting on like why why that does bring us joy. Like what is it about something um so so kind of absurd almost, but such a kind of clear um virilian term applied accident of um, you know, contemporary capital. Um but yeah, it obviously there's a lot of pleasure in it and I think it's worth sitting with why that is and yeah, using it also as a um a kind of moment to be able to discuss what it does make visible as in the nature of the supply chain boats shouldn't be that big <laughs> yeah like the the catastrophe of scale you know in a strange way like and and this is what mole sort of says is that the ever given makes cartoonishly note noticeable some of the crucial infrastructure of global capital and yeah so like in, and I, I, this is, by the way, one of the things I really appreciate about your work is that you're extending this discussion of the integral accident, the thing that is integral to acceleration into the social and social consequences. And, you know, I certainly want to ask you about that. You know, I just recently watched Errol Morris's American Dharma, which is about how, you know, Steve Bannon really exploited the acceleration of the media cycle in order to, you know, get Trump elected and so on. So, I mean, it, the, I think the analogy certainly works, but this, this thing of like the impact of a moment is where I want to kind of go with the conversation because you've written so much on the impact of, you know, moments of violent trauma on the public's imagination. Um, but, you know, it, I wanted to kind of linger on this example of big stuck boat for a second, because like, this is a, a, a case of what Judith Butler in The Force of Nonviolence calls destruction by default. Mm -hmm. There's this really interesting turn in The Force of Nonviolence where Butler says um, there is an attitude that's characteristic of neoliberal capitalism that says, I don't give a damn about destruction. And to quote her, she says, how it gives license to destruction and perhaps even a sense of satisfactory liberation um, in opposing checks on industrial pollution and market expansion. And then she says that this represents a kind of populist attempt to liberate people from the cruel and weakening superego represented by the left and including its feminist, queer and anti-racist proponents of nonviolence. So she's acknowledging that there are these forms of destruction that seem to happen by default and seems to believe that the challenge is still somehow to impose the superego, to like institute and insist on guilt against this like clear incapacity for guilt that, you know, is demonstrated by somebody like Trump. Um, guilt, she says, has to be understood as a mechanism for safeguarding the life of the other. Um, in your essay, looking at corpses from being numerous, you write about the difficult problem of, of sort of figuring out the purpose of displaying the brutalized and killed bodies of black and indigenous people, like figuring out what the what purpose that serves. And you say that Quote, it's only by virtue of looking at the deaths, the corpses, and soon to be corpses of black people like Alton Sterling, Mike Brown, and Tamir Rice, that the media even thought to ask about their lived lives at all. The idea then is that it's somehow difficult, if not impossible, to call into question the state's authority to use this violence without using these images of impact. I wonder, like, at this point, where your thinking is at in relationship, because you were mentioning the kind of ephemerality of the, the impact of these images. Like, how do you think through that dilemma now of trying to kind of preempt the remorse to institute this kind of guilt in order to create some sense of like proactive responsibility uh, when you feel that there are these lives that are just being lost for structural, you know, racist reasons? I mean, can images help us learn not to wait until these soon to be corpses are exposed to premature death? Um, so I think, you know, that the us there is obviously a very, very interesting one. Um, so, uh, you know, and I suppose that the, uh, the like, if, you know, I'm a white media person um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and white academia, white media, you know, those kind of hegemonic spaces, like it's, you know, in a, in a certain way, just in terms of when attention gets drawn to you know, the decimation of black lives by the state. Um, often it is and, you know, tends to be related to, um, yeah, the e exposure through some, you know, dead, deadly and um, exceedingly violent spectacle. But by the same token, like, do I think these, like, obviously, like, no, that kind of um, 
that kind of reliance on spectacle to d- demand a reckoning or on like deadly spectacle to demand a reckoning with the fact of uh, racism. Uh, you know, these spectacles have been on offer for like time immemorial, like, you know, from slavery, pre- like colonialism onwards. Um, and, you know, every, like the logic of it is that, you know, you'll have to rely on the production of more death spectacle in order to end it. So then it becomes this kind of like impossible kind of contradiction, right? Of like, you will only care once you see death, you as in white people in power will only care once you see more death. So I have to, you know, we have to excavate pain and death in order to, and then empirically it hasn't happened, right? Like what has shifted have been, you know, the incredible potent liberation movements and struggles that themselves are not relying on the next death spectacle to organize. So I think the us that is suddenly like, oh, wow, this is something terrible. Um, You know, look at this ongoing racist violence um, and sort of demand more spectacle to be activated against it, um, you know, is absolutely awful. Um, and there are thinkers and writers, I think, who, um, you know, do do a, an excellent job, a far better job than I've ever done at sort of refusing to excavate those spectacles and rely on, you know, uh, another videotaped police murder, um, you know, uh, a, another body of a child refugee washed up from the Mediterranean um, and sort of refusing to bartering those skeptic uh, on in these spectacles um in order to draw attention to uh the violences of racial capitalism the systems that produce these deaths that produce this this ongoing and often not um caught on camera and not visualized um horrors that um of you know colonial relocation exploitation racial capitalism and its ongoing accumulations. Um, and I think, yeah, if uh, any anyone who is in, interested in writing about and kind of drawing attention or talk, working through and reflecting on the nature of these horrors and what, what is to be done and what could possibly be done to uh, overturn them, uh, obviously it, it cannot be a strategy and it would be a very like unethical strategy to just continue to wait for and rely upon um, a kind of overwhelmingly appalling and compelling in the worst sense death spectacle um because you know then then that that in of itself is a you know a, like certainly a really like violent neck politically um exploitative practice so I think that is the challenge right like refusing to um you know barter in that kind of imagery in order to make what feels like a kind of strong, powerful, ethically political point, but remains reliant on these deaths being available to film and share around. And it's also, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, very much makes a difference who, like who is showing which spectacles, which imagery and for what reason. And I think, you know, we've seen really um, interesting examples about you know how when it's when it is truly done in the most uh, exploitative way um for example when um the uh poet writer kenneth goldsmith uh organized a performance around reading mike brown's obri- obituary and this is you know a white man make making art um and turning into this you know uh reified commodity the obituary of uh, an executed young black boy and the the kind of nature of, uh, you know, the taxonomy of his death and, and parts of his body and that becoming a white man's performance. I think we can see the violence of that. And then I think the question is, how different is it when, you know, a white media gaze is also fixating on those details um, and, you know, how to avoid doing that while still not saying, okay, we're not going to address the horror. But I think someone like Harsha Walia does such a good job of, um, you know, focusing on the 
specific systems that produce these and um, how they interconnect and refusing to make them discrete and refusing to rely on the discreteness of an event of, you know, a, a violent execution, uh, a death in the Mediterranean that you then see. Um, so refusing to rely on that kind of spectacle uh, also means a refusal to rely on, you know, demanding that there be more and more deaths so that you can use them as like the example of, of a you know deadly racist system continuing um so i think yeah it is a it is the challenge but also the absolute necessity of thinkers and writers to find a way of doing that without continuing to exploit black and brown death um i think for example about the the aftermath of the grenfell tower fire in june 2017 the kinds of artistic interventions that we've seen emerge from that that do provide that kind of critical context without reproducing the, you know, the spectacular trauma of that fire. Um, you know, like, and, and like, I've been thinking about this a lot in relationship to um, these moments of climate catastrophe as well. And I know, I know you've written about how ecocide should be treated as a crime against humanity and, and how, you know, in many ways, this kind of um, neo-fascist contingent is, is, you know, bent on appropriating a certain kind of like state of emergency around the climate in order to, you know, argue for uh, a, a sort of race realism. Mm -hmm. But um, I think my my reading of like Andreas Malm, for example, uh, is that there are, there are these critical moments where the climate catastrophe becomes visible to people. And it's especially in those moments that we need to, he says, like blow up pipelines, you know, sabotage the actual fossil fuel in infrastructure that's creating these uh, violent climate events. Um, in other words, like he's saying that timing is everything. And and in some of your exchanges with people like Nicholas Mirsoff have kind of, you know, got me thinking in those terms, like this idea that the intense violence of modern life can't be, as Mirsoff says, sealed over quickly, that you have to kind of keep these, um, you know, these, these moments kind of open to reconsideration. Um, you know, uh, so that they don't kind of just become part of this kind of mind numbing media cycle. You know, the way you put it is that you need to turn affective outrage into effective resistance. But that's a huge, obviously a huge challenge. Um, the implication seems to be that communication is somehow crucial and that we need to get the message across that there are some groups that are doomed to be, as Butler puts it, you know, targeted or abandoned or condemned. Um, in your writing for The Intercept, especially, how how do you see your own communication tactics changing? Like, what have you learned about rhetoric, I suppose, the responsibility of journalism, especially in this moment where there are conversations around impartiality versus like moral clarity? Oh, yeah, it's that's, you know, it's it's difficult. I don't know. You, you know, when you're when you're in the like, um, you know, the the, the grind of content production and, and, out, and outrage cycles it is it can feel um very difficult sometimes you do just feel like god I'm I'm just I'm just part of it like am I making am am I and my comrades in this industry be they uh kind of more essayistic or more kind of news cycle based um like are we doing anything at all that helps and I think it's you know I actually don't have an answer to that um when I talk to my students about um, advocacy, advocacy writing, and um, you know, certainly not uh, stenography type AP reporting, um, but even just this idea of tr truth telling and uh, you know, talking about like revelation in in writing. Um, I, you know, I usually just say it's you know it's necessary but deeply insufficient. Like you could like obviously, uh, I'm not saying that like these acts of journalism are meaningless of course they're not um but like in terms of what what work they do in the world the idea that it's just enough to reveal a horror or to to make visible um a kind of system of devastation i mean of course it's not um you know that's why i think uh you know elevating and focusing on the people that are you know in different equivalent ways blowing up the pipelines be they um you know workers going on strike or unionizing work amazon unionizing workers or um you know domestic immigrant my uh, migrant movements and uh you know indigenous 
uh, climate struggle uh, and those kind of uh, interventionary um, actions that very much do throw uh, wrench into the cogs and um, do, I think, you know, far more than any act of writing alone could do. Um, so I think obviously these things have to be, uh, you know, in conversation and in solidarity and kind of porous with each other. Um, I'm obviously not particularly invested in, um, you know, detached, uh, disinterested sort of journalism. Um, you know, I think it's it's a conversation like we probably don't even need to have about, um, you know, myths of neutrality, myths of objectivity. And, uh, you know, it's certainly not something I'm I'm interested in doing myself. Um, it doesn't uh, mean that something's not kind of doesn't, you, you know, it doesn't stop you being a, a materialist writer um dealing with kind of actual you know facts on the ground about the way the the world is built and works and the way truth telling works and the way we get to produce and reify and maintain certain consensus realities in the world um you know that doesn't make me uh some sort of uh wacky relativist it's it's materialist you know in the to borrow from Haraway, uh, you know, the way in which uh, the world is is made, but not made up, if we're talking about scientific posits. And I think media posits work the same way. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, that wholly answers your question. It totally does. And it leads into the next question I wanted to raise, which is around, uh, you know, this, I, this idea of, and I love this sort of, um, you know, this idea of a consensus reality, the notion that the social world especially is, is made, but of course not made up, um, you know, reproduced Marxists love to use that term reproduced. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it, you know, it, in listening closely to your conversation with Mackenzie work again, you know, work is clearly deeply invested in this idea of being able to create a language and to name very kind of like aptly and accurately these, these phenomena and, and your work, you know, takes that up. You, you, in being numerous, you're using this uh, idea of kind of trying to make fascism, for example, uh, not some stable, historically situated term, but more like a verb. You talk about fascisting, like practices of fascisting. Um, and this is, you know, largely, it seems like, you know, or, an organic part of your overall project of trying to think past technology to expose um, acceleration social context, so to speak. So like contemporary fascism, as you seem to you know write about it, is an accident to the extent that it's this cataclysmic collision of a series of demographic trends and political tendencies, not least of which being this individualistic bent of neoliberal capitalism. Um, you know, you you write in in the Intercept. You, I mean, you wrote an article where you actually predicted the the capital siege, basically. Um, saying that like violence is is all but inevitable in this context where you have groups that spread violence as part of their ethos of white supremacy. Um, you know, so I wanted to, I know you've talked about this in other spaces, but, you know, raise some questions about like why you think there is power in naming fascism as such and using this language. There's clearly um, a sort of a aversion to using it. Um, this idea that fascism is sort of overcoded, it's overdetermined. And so, you know, naming Trump a fascist is dangerous. In fact, um, you know, Traverso has this book, New Faces, Faces of Fascism, where he basically argues this. He says, you know, uh, we could define Trump as a post-fascist leader without fascism um, and, his, and says that his fascist behavior is unconscious and in, involuntary uh, because fascism, again, like ideologically is supposed to be this total alternative to what looked like a decadent liberal order. Um, and Trump doesn't pr promote any alternative model for society. He's just a straight up neoliberal uh, economic elite. Um, what do you think is sort of crucially missing about, um, you know, these kinds of characterization of, of Trump and Trumpism? Like what is Traverso missing in not naming Trumpism a fascist ideology? Um, right. So actually, funnily enough, I uh, reviewed uh, that, that text of Traverso's for uh, the TLS I think it was two years ago, last year. Um, and I thought, you know, I, th I actually think it's a, it's a great, great book, particularly because it, it it makes a point that I 
very much agree with, even though we would, I think we disagree on on kind of points of rhetoric mm-hmm. and their uses. Like specifically, um, I would, you know, argue for for not talking about post-fascism, even though I entirely know what he means by it and it has a, a lot of points. And instead would see the, um, you know, the 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 productive use of, of uh, the of anti-fascists calling themselves anti-fascists and opposing themselves to the the fascisms that we're willing to name um but what he does do a, a wonderful job of insisting upon um against some of the more um kind of li- liberal panic about norm busting um is talking about the convergence and both you know not just in the US but but in Europe um also and you know and in India and in Brazil um not just saying like look this far right right is its own kind of sweet, generous, far out thing that has emerged um, that, uh, you know, liberal democracy is, it must organize against um, because they are kind of not of the same and they are, one is an aberration from the other, um, not an outgrowth. And he, you know, he makes the just empirically correct point um, that the contemporary far right, what he would call uh, post-fascism, which I am comfortable as I'll uh, go on to kind of detail, um, comfortable to call fascism, uh, is, you know, entirely reliant on uh, conversion with this uh, convergence with the center and a center that that bends more and more to um, the kind of the the nationalisms um, within a neoliberal order um, that the far right demands. Um, I think uh, in terms of why why I find it important and useful to include quite a kind of capacious uh, use of the word fascism is that, um, you know, we, when you name something fascism, you, and are like naming it in, in, in opposition to it, you're calling upon, it's a very kind of specific perlocutionary act, right? You want to produce an anti-fascist effect. Um, and an anti-fascist response, because I feel like a, a kind of liberal response of just this is a, you know, this is a, a national, this is just nationalism. This is just um, xenophobia. And it is all these things. Um, but I think it is also fascism in that, you know, there is a specific set of desires around power, oppression, white supremacy, um, certain types of nationalism, gendered violence um, that you know, it it can very comfortably fit under fascism in a way that we know what we mean when we say it. And we are then calling upon each other to have, uh, you know, a, an anti-fascist response of zero tolerance to it, which is not to say, okay, you know, this is, this is just a kind of another political, another kind of point in conservatism that we will debate and reveal its internal contradictions and it will wither away and on goes you know, accident-free liberal democracy and, you know, neo-colonial expansion and excavation and extraction and um, exploitation. Um, So I think calling something fascism, uh, I think I can understand the argument when people say, if you do that, it's like treating it as an aberration. Um, So it would almost foreclose a kind of more nuanced and correct interrogation of, of how it is an outgrowth of uh, modernity and capitalism but you know that that to me is just a misunderstanding of of fascism in in all its forms including historically i mean even regime based 20th century european fascism like you know uh, fascism um was itself um you know born of colonial techniques the pra- the techniques of fascism were um you know then continuous and congruent with modernity and capitalism and certain versions of, you know, nation state building and um, collapses of empire and up holding on to different kinds of neo-colonialisms. So I think if you're going to have a proper understanding of fascism in a historical context, it was never an aberration. So it isn't now. And I find the kind of perlocutionary force of saying this is fascist, we need an anti-fascist response of zero tolerance to it. I find that just useful and I don't know, I don't agree that it it kind of risks um, kind of overuse or diminishment. You know, if it does get, when you do see uh, kind of a a, a centrist liberal use of it in a way that seems to almost be disciplining the left, you know, saying like, this is fascism, Um, we, we are opposed to it. 
Um, and it wasn't what an aberration. Where did this come from? We got to get back to normal. Of course, I don't want it to be used that way. And I think we can resist that sort of reductive thinking about it and say, like, no, 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 we are using it in a very specific way. Um, because I, you know, uh, as Umberto Eco wrote, and as I agree with, as a kind of a Vicken, like kind of huge Wittgenstein fan myself. I don't want to say Wittgensteinian. That seems <laughs> a little, um, it's like not, not going to give myself that. <laughs> but, um, you know, to, to talk about how, how fascism works like a language game. The idea that all concepts, um, or indeed most concepts, are kind of perfectly predefined along a kind of rules as rails model, wherein I can tell you in advance a perfect definition such that any future example of fascism, you'll be able to go, yes, yes, no, no, this is or isn't as if these lines are so perfectly drawn. But of course, not only is that not how, uh, you know, certain political factions and political ideologies and constellations work, it's not how language works. I mean, Wittgenstein's famous example was the word game, of course, that there isn't, uh, you know, a perfect uh, pre-definition that, that, will uh, in advance and currently fit every time that we, every every kind of instance of when we might want to call something a game, but yet we walk around the world untroubled when we talk about games. We know what we're doing and we make sense to each other because that is how language works through consensus and use, um, meaning as use. And so the idea that, that fascism, meanwhile, and you know, any other political labels, uh, unlike so much of everyday language, must in fact be static. And if every criteria isn't met, then it is not fascism. Um, just seems like, uh, you know, not a good understanding of language and also not politically particularly useful. Um, I think a term like post-fascism uh, is, you know, I, I'm not actually, I'm not opposed to that. I don't think we actually have a particularly different um, diagnosis uh, of what what we're talking about, Traverso and I, um, and you know, post definitely doesn't mean after, right? It means uh, for, you know, continued um, with you know alterations, and I think that kind of captures what I'm saying too. I'm just saying well, I can I can do without the post, but yeah. So so I think it's a mixture of um, how I think we should understand the the workings of meaning making per se uh, on one side, and then also the kind of political usefulness of uh you know calling calling a a certain fascist naming a fascism to call into being a kind of anti-fascist response and attitude yeah i mean and your work is is evidence of this kind of investment right political and conceptual investment in you know uh creating the right amount of of outrage alarm you know i mean uh, so you're you're using you're weaving together the the material facts of you know for example an unbelievable spike in hate crimes with this kind of rising resurgent form of white nationalism. So like th this to me is the reason why I think your work is um, you know it, first of all it's it's prophetic like in in many ways the the work of um, you know journalists on the left has been uh, uh, to kind of almost predict the next the next accident. Uh, in the context of Trump. Um, and what I think also it's so valuable for is this kind of, as you say, zero tolerance policy um, that is is deeply invested in in naming fascism as such, like not trying to kind of pull our punches and say, well, if we're really being careful with our language, maybe Trump is more of an authoritarian populist, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, instead trying to, as, as you sort of articulated in being numerous, deny racist nationalism any space, any oxygen, in order to not underestimate uh, what you call unreasoned racism, to make fascist life intolerable by naming it as such. And like, this is the thing I kind of wanted to ask you, because, um, you know, there is this moral clarity in your work around this point. And, um, you know, my last interview was actually with Daniel Lombroso, who's the director of White Noise. Um, and White Noise follows Richard Spencer, uh, Mike Cernovich and Lauren Southern, as they gen you know try to generate this alt right hate and and this kind of white nationalist sentiment, um, and so in some sense that film is predicated on a some tolerance policy when it comes to giving a platform to people like Spencer. Like I think that film is an interesting you know uh, primary source document. 
Um, but it does also provide a, a cinematic account of the emptiness of these figures that is dependent on sort of acts of critical translation to do the work. And so like in the opening essay of, of being numerous, you say like some see a certain tactical and moral value in allowing people like Spencer to speak publicly and rally, believing that their, the fallacies of their hateful view, views are best made visible and therefore subject to debate and reason, um, you know, to kind of expose it to the light of day so that it will implode. You, you just disagree with that um, sort of attitude. And so like... Um, where do you currently stand on this kind of this overarching project of like withdrawing the spaces where white supremacy can foment? You know, like, do you still feel like it has to be this kind of zero tolerance policy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, it, it, these are the kind of confrontations that need to happen, right? That these kind of virtual confrontations that can disable platforms like Parler, uh, that can do away with these trends. And do, I mean, I guess the other question is, do you think a more serious deplatforming has to be demanded and and whose hand should that be be in in some sense? Right. And yeah, this is so I think, you know, that these conversations uh, really emerged and it's just a very interesting shift because I've been um, on the kind of arguing for deplatforming, you know, uh, consistently like that is always that's long been my my and, and many other anti-fascist uh, self-identifying anti-fascist thinkers um, for a long time. I mean, that is often the anti-fascist project, right? Shutting things down. Um, and where it becomes obviously difficult um, and the, where I don't have, um, you know, gr a great answer is uh, in whose hands, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I do agree with uh, Judith P Butler's points from Excitable Speech that like obviously um, – there is a, a kind of violence in the state's naming and state reliant censorships and understanding of of criminalization per se. So, uh, you know, asking the state um, to name things, you know, and I, I, I mean this in terms of uh, when we're talking about hate crimes or crimes against humanity, like a, uh, understanding something as having, uh, you know, people who are the perpetrators who we want to work against, um, you know, we can do that without maybe the language of criminalization. But, you know, then we're also here talking about sort of Silicon Valley leviathans having this, this immense power. Um, and obviously, like, uh, I think we can, we can walk and chew gum at the same time and say, you know, uh, a more democratically, uh, organized, you know, worker owned set of social media platforms would be preferable. Um, and we can also say it's a good thing that Twitter as is removed Donald Trump and, you know, had a had a kind of moment of removing disinformation from the, far, you know, anti-vax disinformation, QAnon, um, and, you know, really cutting down um, the space in which these you know, fascistic life worlds have been building and flourishing um, because, you know, a lot of these things do work through production of community, production of truth making, meaning making within these communities. I think removing the ability for those ideas to spread per se, um, I don't call it censorship. Um, I call it like an, inter an intervention, an intervention for uh, better better political life worlds to flourish, less oppress oppressive spaces, um, and so you know, I, I, in a in a kind of in a just world, um, the you know oppressed peoples most affected by the circulation of these ideologies, these uh, oppressive speech acts, uh, these violent constellations, uh, would be able to determine. Um, a, a space of no platforming. It wouldn't have to be reliant on, you know, the decisions of, of vastly powerful tech CEOs. But it's also worth remembering that, you know, a lot of just kind of normal working class anti-fascists um, have d like do the work of, um, you know, finding out when there are far right groups and figures, um, you know, gaining followings online being platformed online and you know they they alert youtube to it so it's not like youtube has ever been particularly invested in this stuff it did take um organizing and um you know people 
giving a damn in order for for these kind of acts against um a, you know these oppressive speech acts to be taken um and i would say far too late um but you know i'm i'm glad that that finally happened and i think we can see the benefit in terms of removing trump from twitter you know almost immediately um and i think you know sometimes people there's the the kind of old old canard of you know you just push this stuff underground it's like well it's still harder to operate and gather followings underground than overground um and you know it's just uh in we're talking about certain um institutions right beyond just like the social media platform if we're talking about the university or a given publication publishing uh you know tom cotton's uh center tom cotton's mm. fascistic call for um the military to basically sweep up uh, black lives matter protesters um you know when we're talking about these these institutions uh that that aren't you know the expanse of the internet i think we can talk seriously about like intervening with the kind of uh, oppressive speech acts that are allowed to flourish in them and really think of them not just in terms of a very reductive um positivistic idea of like marketplace of ideas um framing of of capital f capital s free speech um but rather thinking about um more seriously about you know speech as action meaning in use um and a kind of speech acts model that really pays attention to what the kind of illocutionary and perlocutionary force of some of these um oppressive speech acts entail that it's not just someone from the far right when they speak and rally and you know call out trans students when Milo was doing that at his um mm -hmm university talks that were shut happily shut down uh by uh anti antifa groups um you know when richard spence that uh, talks about white nationalism and the you know threat of uh population demographic change the way that he does this isn't just you know in this kind of reductive marketplace of ideas understanding of um the kind of political speech sphere this isn't just someone saying uh you know this is my belief about the way of the world this is a constitutive description of how i think the world is and should be you know which is the very kind of meaning of of protective speech and if that's all it was then we are kind of talking about debate and the kind of untruth and uh illegitimacy of uh statements like like a spencer statement like bannon statement like stephen miller's policies would would become clear um and could probably be decimated by just uh you know shining a light on them but that's actually not all that speech does um you know there is a kind of calling into being of a uh, fascist audience uh and an and an actualizing of that every time these uh new oppressive speech acts are brought into our midst um and obviously that's very different from uh you know within as we are now like we are discussing spencer now um but there's a crucial difference and i you know butler makes this point too between something but she actually takes 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 the uh opposite conclusion than than i think i do um is that these these kind of racisms transphobias like various modes of oppressive speech they're deeply citationally available right that is the history of this country um it's not like when you remove the far right from contemporary speaking opportunities and uh the realms of debate that we're suddenly going to be like oh well we don't know what it is and what it means so how can we fight it like well, of course we do mm. um we, <laughs> this is america um and the same could be said of you know when i'm in england you know that that gray little former colony uh colonial power um so um you know this idea that we won't be able to like understand name and talk about for example fascism and how it how it flourishes develops if we don't have these kind of contemporary examples being put in kind of profiles in the news given platform mm -hmm. like i just don't i it's simply not true because it is kind of historically so rich richly available for citation it's almost offensive to say no we keep we we have to keep hearing from them um because you know what is white supremacy it's like well if you don't know that you're probably you're probably not going to be much help in the struggle now anyway um mm. and i definitely don't need to hear uh bring in a new instance of 
this kind of oppressive speech to be able to name it, discuss it, and, you know, see it for what it is. Um, so this kind of constant exposure and new exposure, um, I think the argument that kind of we need it to understand the state of it, um, you know, I think I think that's something kind of ignorant and dangerous, to be honest. Yeah, the risk is perhaps too great. I mean, like amplifying, citing, and, and you know, in some sense, in, inadvertently promoting, um, you know, manifestos by you know, the El Paso shooter, for example, like these kinds of things. Um, I think you're right to point out that we don't really uh, need these things. And in reproducing, it may, you know, end up uh, creating too much space for it. Um, yeah. And, and that the, a distinction needs to be made between censorship uh, and, and intervention to create less oppressive spaces. Like, I think that's, that's, um, I entirely agree there. Um, and, and in order to reclaim you know, really, you know, massively important projects of survival, you know, like the Green New Deal. I mean, in your article on the El Paso, Paso shooting and eco-fascism, you, you talk about how Spencer and, and this El Paso shooter have tried to kind of reappropriate this, this language of uh, a world in decline, world you know, resources being somehow more scarcely available. Um, and, you know, Federico fin Finkelstein talks about this in a br in brief history of fascist lives, the idea that this terrorist invoked a truth that had nothing to do with actual history or with reality. He was promoting just a vile and racist metric that he and others believed should be the standard for determining citizenship. You say against that, that, um, you know, we need to understand that there are ample resources, there are, there's adequate abundance, and that we need to allow for the free movement of people. You know, that, like, in order to make space for that kind of, um, you know, message to resonate, I think you have to, on some level, yeah, like jettison these hateful vo voices that can tap into already existent demographic trends around like this fear of like white extinction or displacement. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and, you know, my next question was sort of around uh, this issue of time, actually. Um, you know, the Alexander Minister has this book, Proud Boys in the White Ethnostate, where, you know, she talks about the alt-right projection of white demise and how it incites this idea of a race against time, right? A looming racial oblivion. You know, Spencer talks in White Noise about the paradigm breaking down, you know, these kind of catastrophes, ruptures and, and turnovers. The obsession with time, Stern says, is a crucial dimension of the alt-right imagination. Um, you know, she has this beautiful phrase which says, as the temporal horizon closes in and speeds up, White nationalists want to push a primordial past and a techno-utopian future into a present they feel is both slipping out of their hands and perhaps within reach, and says upsetting those timescapes might be one of the most effective ways to push back against this, this dystopian vision. Um, you, you've written with Brad Evans in the introduction to Violence, Human, and Dark Times about this issue of, of time, of, of having enough time. Um, you say, if fighting violence and oppression demands new forms of ethical thinking that can only be developed with the luxury of time, what does it mean for the present moment when history is being steered in a more dangerous direction and seems to constantly accelerate? Um, like you talked about the crunch of being a journalist and not knowing whether you're kind of making an impact. Is time for you the kind of key variable, having the time to cultivate the kinds of bonds necessary to live nonviolently? Or like conversely, do we actually have to kind of maybe accept that the parameters of struggle established by this modernist acceleration of decision making doesn't give us that luxury of like ethical thinking that we have to perhaps demand nonviolence, but accept that it needs to be achieved through confrontation and what looks to liberals like violence? Right. And of course, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a proponent of counterviolence, right? Like I, um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I actually, my, in my, I reviewed Judith Butler's Force of Nonviolence for Book Forum, um, you know, quite critically, because I, I think her vision of nonviolence that she says is a kind of required new, as in like new, we need to enter a new time frame of, of how we, like the world thinking in terms of how we are interdependent and what that would mean. Whereas actually, uh, <laughs> the, there are, um, you know, ancient and ongoing versions of that. If you look about at, um, kind of uh in indigenous modes of knowledge and community um and the way in which um we kind of saw that that understanding of, of connectivity interdependence and porousness um spill into the streets during the 2020 uprisings 
it's like, well, you know, look to the people that already have been doing that and have had their their worlds decimated by by the the um you know barbaric systems that that Butler and I both ag- agree are the same ones. Um, so in terms, sorry, that's not exactly an answer to time, but I think you know that's the difficulty. Things have to be um, kind of all at once and and slow. And I think what's interesting is that people often don't think enough when there is, and you know, largely thinking in terms of parliamentary victories or failures, which isn't or tends to be my focus, but the ways they intersect with with movements and liberation movements is that you hear quite a lot from uh what seems like sort of baffled liberals being like well you know the the right had the tea party and uh then was able to kind of sweep uh into congress and you know lay the groundwork for trumpism and the kind of new republican party that is kind of just the same as the old one but with a different kind of uh posturing um what about the left what about the left and you know I'd argue that in terms of time you know we 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 have as you know and Corey Robin makes this point well like you know that it is the left that's had been on the back foot uh in so many ways and so I'm almost impressed time-wise by that you know within a decade and let's say like Occupy was a major inflection point um, the left has both has kind of built and is as robust as it is, um, you know, including in p- kind of parliamentary represent- representative terms, but far, far, far beyond that, because this is a kind of politics from the ground up that was built out of a kind of decimated space. Uh, you know, the right didn't have to deal with uh, its own ideological decimation through like the end of history um, and uh, kind of Cold War and post Cold War um, presumptions of you know the the ultimate victory of liberalism, decimation of left leftist movements. Um, I mean, historically, the decimation of of Black lives and ind- indigenous space and lives, um, and uh, you know, and just kind of leftism in general decimated the um, you know around the war on terror. Um, the end of the anti-globalization movement. And so sort of almost, you know, building on the shoulders of, of liberation struggles, but against a kind of uh, wiping out that, you know, took away almost a generation who just became uh, kind of Blairite, Clintonite, third way Democrats. Um, so, you know, in a way, time has not been on the side of the left. And I think we've made up an, an incredible amount of of time quite quickly. Um, and I think what's interesting in terms of the the far right and this kind of con- conception of time running out for for, for the whites, uh, and if only tr- if it were only true that that whiteness um, and the kind of property that it means and um, how it functions were indeed, uh, you know, the, were the, the clock truly running down on it, that would be, if it were that urgent, that would be great. Um, I, alas, I, I disagree. Um, but, you know, I think this this focus on time is an interesting one on the right, because of course, um, the kind of construction of, of whiteness and the kind of frontier nationalist thinking that so defined it historically around space um, kind of, you know, has reached its limits, certainly in America. And so then the kind of maintenance of the established space that used to be about expansion um, in terms of territorial uh, freedom as defined by the ability to territorially expand, when that no longer exists, the kind of focus on holding space, um, ensuring the immobility of others, be it through mass incarceration or border imperialism, um, and then bringing in the kind of dimension of urgency and time. I hadn't really thought about it before, but sort of interesting that shift as a focus from space to kind of world history, world historical time um, is an interesting one. And I hadn't thought about that until you brought it up. Um, but, you know, it, I think your answer, you know, gives me a lot to sort of chew on. And, I, you know, taking Butler's book, like there's this one passage in your review where you say capital capital is the sovereign force that orders a blood sacrifice of the poor, the incarcerated and the sick. In the face of it, Butler's hopeful framing of nonviolence is inadequate. Um, you know, Anna Singh on this podcast has talked about how hope is a tricky thing. It's a thing that is a, a kind of a trap that can inoculate real rage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can also um, blind you to already existing alternatives. You know, this is another thing that you talk about um, in the, in the, uh, review. And you, you say in your review that every 10 pages or so you found yourself writing in the margins, who is this for? Yeah. 
I think that's all right, actually. And I know that, you know, it's an ongoing debate about like, whose job is it to speak to whom? Um, And, you know, I like, but you know, this isn't an academic book, it's a verso book. So it's kind of in that middle, Um, but it should be for a general readership. So it's like, who do you, who needs to hear this? It's certainly Mm. not, you know, the uh, people in the street for black lives. It's certainly not uh, people at the forefront of indigenous struggle. It's certainly not, uh, you know, the sex workers and the, trans activists um on the front lines here and you know it's not even people that are reading the news in any kind of focused way so anyone who's likely to pick up the judith butler book like it kind of i just felt a bit grumpy because it's like who needs to hear this like me and i think i put in the review like maybe your her contemporaries in in the academy need to hear that you know it's it's the state actually right it's the it's capitalism actually so, you know, we need a whole new vi- uh, non-violent imaginary that, uh, you know, affirms our interdependence. And yeah, and then my point is like whole new or the way that, you know, indigenous life has always been organized when it can be, when it isn't, you know, just destroyed. And the same with, you know, uh, a lot of the nature of liberation struggles have long understood this and functioned on that presupposition. And, you know, I I found it refreshing for that reason. I don't think it's unfair to Butler. I mean, she's raising questions that could be, um, you know, for example, like troubling our ability to even name violence as such, to name state violence, you know, as as part of this philosophical exercise in pointing out that violence is determined sort of hegemonically, right? And she, she kind of bars us from doing any sort of calculus around violence, which is the kind of calculus that you provide in some sense in being numerous. Like you say, any discussion about violence in Antifa must note that since 1990, there have been 450 deaths caused by white supremacist violence in the United States, compared to only one believed to be related to, the, to far left activity. In the same way, you're, you're doing this kind of quantitative analysis of public opinion, where you talk about the response to Richard Spencer being punched in the head, that there was far fewer major newspapers, you know, uh, um, you know, decrying violence on the right than than saying this was a poor tactic for the left. You know, I think that's the kind of calculus that it provides a certain clarity. Oh, yeah, and that was even after Charlottesville, right? When when there had been like a far right murder, and people were you know, chanting "Jews will not replace us," and you know, doing their sort of clan like performances, and and you know, a, a black man got beaten up with metal poles by Nazis, like you know, and then yeah, the the response from from, you know, broadsheets was, um, you know, there was obviously condemnation, but there was as much condemnation of, as you say, tactics like a Nazi punch and just the the risks of the far left in the following months. So, yeah, like <laughs> depressing but predictable stuff. Right. You've written about so many things that I'd, I'd like to talk about. You know, your, your um, article for The Guardian on COVID uh, made some really important claims uh, uh, around, as you say, the horrifying stakes involved when life is reconfigured wholly in market terms. Again, speaking to the need for really an entirely different like worldview to come into being in this COVID moment. You say in The Guardian, there are more than enough resources to go around, and yet you have this incredible consolidation of wealth among the the ruling elites. Um, why Why is it necessary in moments like this to illuminate the fact that in order to have any sort of like political course correction, you have to like reckon with your own assumptions about the social contract. Why are these political writers gobsmacked that capitalism has never been linked by a contract of responsibility with the social? And do you think COVID is starting to show or, or like give us an occasion, I guess, to, to think through the ways in which our fundamentally individualistic society has, has really lost any sense of the social contract? Yeah, and I also, you know, the the thing I always find um, funny, but in a bad way, uh, about when people kind of uh, say, like, you know, the social contract rendered uh, apart in this moment, or you know, and under Trump, or all, all kinds of times that you've seen, you know, usually liberal co- columnists refer to it as like with the, the contract with whom? I mean, mm. like, when 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 did this kind of ide- ideal state actually ever come into being that you feel is so lost? Um, you know, like, uh, inside, if you're talking from this, like, white heron-voked democracy that has been the kind of foundation of uh, the U.S., and I think, um, actually, uh, uh, Christina Beltran has written kind of really 
really well, I think, a uh, new book called uh, Cruelty of Citizenship about, you know, w- the, the contract, the social contract uh, in America was was always uh, exclusionary and um, organized about around around whiteness. So so anyone who's like, it is it is ripped apart. I was like, well, it, it, you know, that, that nations, no nation state was ever formed that way through this kind of participation of, of um, consenting equals. Um, so to kind of talk about the the rending of a myth that never was a reality, I find like irritating. And and I don't know if people just sort of do it as a turn of phrase, as a way to kind of point to things being really bad and aren't trying to do anything. I know that, that you know, no one's trying to be um, actively, like intentionally racist by talking about uh, the social contract that's been ripped apart. Um, and, you know, like the great promises that were never kept and it was like well you know those promises were only ever made to kind of propertied white people um and so like never realized for really anyone else so I just kind of don't like um the kind of the kind of thinking and the kind of worldview that that is upheld when you start to talk about like a social contract breaking down um and I think you know there's a certain I think it you know it, it 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 made more sense I think for um a kind of you know sorry to okay boomer it, but yeah, like a kind of presumption of post-war abundance and uh, full employment and uh, the idea of this, you know, that there is maybe this social contract that can be, uh, you know, fruitful and everyone can earn enough money and, you know, American dream, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, that that totally forgets that, like, that that post-war economy is the the exemption that that is used to sort of prove the rule of capitalism's possibilities to provide on mass um as opposed to decimate on mass um and then you know the, the, those people just happen to be the age of the people largely in power now um and the fact that you know it feels like such a kind of uphill struggle to be like no you guys were the exception ex- exemption um this is capitalism working you're watching it working and it's vile um capitalism working is jeff bezos and you know workers having to piss in bo- in bottles um so i think you know that that idea of you know who who got to believe in the social contract and feel like it was in play and working for whom um you know very few people in the first place and those that did based on a kind of you know exceptional economic circumstance that that is not the standard and certainly isn't coming back. Um, Imani Perry's book, Vexy Thing, talks about this kind of, you know, becoming common sense of entrepreneurialism, like how, uh, you know, in the gig economy, you know, we're all supposed to be pursuing this, uh, uh, this self-made state, um, you know, of, of loving our jobs and so on. And, and it, it really does like, Butler's right that it does foreclose any notion of collectivity, that kind of thing becoming normative and so on. Um, and I think the social contract is like, especially in the United States, really promoting that kind of ideology of entrepreneurialism on, on some level that anyone can make it. Um, but yeah, as you rightly point out, it's, it's displacing other realities, right? Um, the, the, the forms of marginalization, exploitation that that really is predicated on. Um, you know, in this example of of Amazon workers and, and delivery drivers having to uh, relieve themselves in unhygienic and un yeah unconscionable sorts of ways, like this is again speaking to the nature of uh, acceleration under capitalism. But um, and like and I like that you you cite the sort of um, OK Boomer meme on some level because this is what I think your Guardian article provides is a sort of clarity around the generational nature of that struggle. You know, like you're you're kind of, you know, making the same point, point Butler is that individualism undergirds all of this kind of um, exclusion. But you're doing it with a sharper sense of the specific historical configuration of power relations that are responsible. Like you you say we need to commit to an undressing of the economic ideology that defined the baby boomer generation and its legacy. Um, and I think you are kind of seeing that happen. But there is clearly a struggle. Mm-hmm. And I wondered if, it, you know, like the as my kind of last question, whether we can zoom out on this moment and see the need to fight from a global or even kind of like cosmic perspective, like looking down on the earth from above in this moment of impending climate collapse from, let's say, the perspective of like a hypothetical 
alien species? Like, how can we try to understand um, what human beings are doing to one another? What, you know, purpose protest serves in this moment? What putting bodies in the street in order to, you know, demand uh, what Butler kind of suggests we need to through nonviolent means, um, you know, safeguarding against destruction, basically, is how she puts it. Um, you know, it, can we zoom out on this moment and and try and gauge the kind of, you know, absurdity of it, of it all? This title metaphor in your book of being numerous is not incidentally about this kind of teeming mass of information production, like zooming out and seeing the building of this infrastructure like, how are you feeling at this yeah. moment? Uh, yeah, you know. no, it's, it's, I mean, the, the task is vast, but, you know, mm-hmm. to pretend that, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, people, people on mass are also taking it up and doing incredible things collectively, like necessarily collectively, be that through the kind of uh, true kind of mutual aids acts of, of caring and caring against a kind of uh, atomized individualism and, you know, taking to the streets and not just demanding, but in, in and of itself, the act of, of resisting and, and striking and, and trying to shut down some of the, the flows of capital and its uh, kind of pr- production and reliance on human capital. Um, and we see incredible resistance and liberation movements with a, and crucially, um, an internationalist understanding, um, an understanding that, you know, there needs an internationalist response to uh, global forms of oppression, global interconnected forms of oppression. Um, And, you know, that includes, uh, you know, rejecting the kind of uh, return to normal uh, liberal consensus uh, efforts. It means pushing against that. It means pushing certainly against the um, fascioid constellations as they emerge and, and maintain power. Um, And that, you know, by which I mean in the US, particularly and elsewhere, abolition um, and, uh, uh, you know, a a total abolition, uh, total opposition to modes of kind of carcerality, organizing um, oppression and lives, particularly black lives. Um, And then crucially rejecting in the fiercest terms, uh, you know, that kind of red brown alliance that we're seeing take up, you know, definitely a lot of air and on the, in the Twitter sphere, um, the kind of allegedly leftist argument for closed borders and nationalisms uh, that A, totally fail to understand uh, the nature of, of displacement and the nature of uh, nationalism and neoliberalism not, in fact, being uh, in contention at all, in fact, working ever quite well together, um, you know, the state still being the the arbiter of 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 how a neoliberalism can function, um, even if you know it's Jeff Bezos who's taking up taking all the money, um, but I think you know standing as firmly against that so called leftism uh, is that work too, and that means taking up um, you know and understanding the nece- necessity of an internationalism, which is very hard, but and you know but also doesn't disclose you know situated and community-based care structures and struggle. In fact, it's reliant on that. Um, You can't do one without the other. Um, But yeah, of course, that just means the task is is massive. But obviously, Mm -hmm. um, what else are you gonna do? (laughs) Yeah, um, this is how Chomsky, Noam Chomsky has been putting it over and over again, um, that the task is vast, but when you look at the alternative, there there is no alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, as as you say in the introduction to violence, humans in dark times, to bring out the best in us, we have to confront the worst of what humans are capable of doing to one another. In short, there is a need to confront the intolerable realities of violence perpetrated in this world. Um, yeah, so uh, I really appreciate you making the time. This has been really exciting to talk to you. Thank you so much. It was such a nice conversation. Thank you.